Okay, I don't have a lot of time here, but I want to continue with Colossians. Now, we talked about setting your mind on things above, um, which are contrasted to all these things that he warned us that they are enticing us with. Um, and he already told us that do not handle, do not taste, do not touch is of no value against fleshly indulgence um, and perfecting the flesh according to men's tradition and self uh, uh, you know depriving the body of things and self abasement and religion and tradition and ordinances and law that doesn't work okay he, he warned us don't go that way he warned us that people would try to spoil us from Christ uh, by recommending these other things none of that works that's the point is none of it works so when he says when Christ who is our life shall appear then you also appear with him in glory mortify therefore your members which are on the earth fornication uncleanness inordinate affection evil consumption and covetousness which is idolatry for which things say wrath of God is coming upon the children of disobedience he can't be recommending law keeping here so people will take these verses and say see he's telling you to keep the law and keep commandments no <laughs> uh, and this is why it is so important to make outlines of the Bible you know, if you're a teacher or even someone pursuing to know Christ and know the Bible, don't spend all your time listening to YouTube videos uh, for answers to your questions. Spend at least a portion of your time writing outlines of the main topics of each chapter in Paul's letters. And again, it doesn't have to... I said this in that Timothy message just a few days ago. It doesn't have to be fancy. But can you summarize the main point of each chapter in a sentence or two so that you know how the ideas connect to each other? See, I know when I'm in reading chapter 3, I know what the main point of chapter 2 is, which is all a warning not to be carried off as spoil or judged unworthy of my reward. And I know how they're going to do it. They're going to entice me through all these religious uh, things that appear to have a wisdom of, of self-chosen forms of worship but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh and I know that I'm dead with Christ and I know that I'm to hold the head and I know I'm complete in Christ and I know that all along he's been saying you know, I want you to know the full knowledge of his will, which is the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, and that I want you to come to the full uh, assurance of understanding that this is the way God's doing it. It's Christ. And you were crucified with him, and that you've been circumcised, and I know what that means. It means that the end of my religious efforts, and you've been buried with him, that's the end of God's expectations on you, and you've been forgiven of all of your trespasses and sins and he's not holding them against you and he's blotted out the handwriting of ordinances which was contrary to you so you don't need to take them up again they weren't of any good against the indulgence of the flesh anyway he's already said all that so when I come to this verse I already have that background so no one can come to me with Colossians 3 5 and put me back under law mortify your members which are on the earth are you sure you're saved? Uh, did you know that covetousness is idolatry? Are you really repentant? Or do you covet? You know. Uh, okay, so we can, we can dispense with all the people that try to use these kind of verses to put us back under law. They have no idea what Colossians is about. If anyone comes to you with a verse in a Bible to attack your knowledge of your assurance of salvation, ask them what the chapter is about, and then ask them what the book is about. What? And they can't tell you, because their theology is just a patchwork of different verses they've collected 
to make a, a scarecrow of Christ and a patchwork uh, arguments, you know. That, uh, and we don't want to be like that. And the only way to get free of that is to know the Bible. And the best way to know the Bible is to know. And that's why when I study a bi uh, book like this, it may seem exhaustive. Dave keeps pouring over these verses again and again and again. How many times is he going to go through chapter 2 and say the same thing? Well, it's because I'm making a point to connect each section to the sections that precede it and give you the whole context again and again so that you are seeing the thread of what the apostle's saying. Uh, cause, not because I don't think you can get it, but because I'm trying to teach you a method I'm trying to impart, this is how I study the Word. I don't jump out of the book. I don't take um, these verses and run off and go try to find some verses from Proverbs and James and uh, Peter and other books in the Bible uh, to collect them and put them all together according to the cross-references and say this is the answer uh, for this verse. You know, some of these people, when, they, when you say, when they do their... Th studies on their YouTube channels they literally say they'll take a verse like this and they'll say now what? let's see what this means well you have to look at the cross references <laughs> the cross references weren't written by the authors of the Bible they were written by translators later and they're not inspired sometimes they can be helpful but that's not how we study the Bible we don't jump out of the book we're in and find out what a different book says before we understand what Paul's actually saying in this book, that confuses people, and that's why people can't read their Bible, because that's what pastors do, and they don't come up with a coherent theology, and so when people read the Bible, they don't understand what it's saying, because they can't reach the conclusions the pastors reached, because they're, they, they don't know how to jump around randomly and come up with their own thing. When they read Colossians, it doesn't seem to say that. So they give up and say, well, I must be wrong because that guy went to school. You know, anyway, mortify your members, therefore, which are on the earth. Therefore, therefore what? Therefore, meaning everything I've said before, you're dead and you're risen with Christ. Your members are on the earth. Christ is in the heavens and your life is in the heavens. Your Christian life is in the heavens. The manifestation of your Christian life is heavenly and it's hidden. And now, are these things, is he ta really talking about sinful things? Yes, but inordinate affection, consubians, our evil consubians, covetousness, don't look evil to a religious person. Paul's religion was covetousness. The commandment, thou shalt not covet, killed him because he found out that his religious pursuit of righteousness and approval before men, uh, seeking approval of men and justification by works, was actually a form of covetousness. He was coveting the glory of God. He wanted righteousness apart from Christ. That's covetousness. And it's evil, but it looks good. Um uncleanness we assume that that means looking at nudie mags but when Paul okay now I am going to jump out here but in Corinthians when Paul talks about the false teachers and the false apostles he tells them to separate from these false teachers these evil workers and he says come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. The unclean thing in religious terms has to do with Baal worship. And Paul says, what fellowship does Belial have with Christ or the table of the Lord with the table of demons? And the false teachers bring you another Jesus. They bring you Baal, the hard taskmaster, and they bring you into bondage to the elements of his world system. But they do it in the name of Christ. That's the subtlety. And they do it through your lusts. Uh, your need for acceptance by God and to be approved in the flesh and to perfect the flesh so that you can get the guilties off your back 
you want justification apart from the blood of Jesus Christ and you'll seek it through dead works puts you in line to be enticed and seduced and bewitched to kiss Baal. When Elijah uh, had said, you know, I, 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 they've destroyed your altars and killed the prophets and I'm the only one left, he said, no, I have 7,000 that have not kissed Baal. That's a really interesting term. Kissed means he's a false husband. It's a term of intimacy. And Baal is a false Christ. He was Tammuz, uh, presented by the Queen of Heaven, Nimrod's wife, the son of uh, the dragon, and she capitalized on the promise of the seed of the woman and said, this is actually the Messiah. And at, at Babel, she demanded that the populace worship this person, Tammuz, who was said to be the incarnation of God on earth when Nimrod died. She deified him. She said she was the queen of heaven and associated herself with the moon. He was the uh, god and associated with the sun. He was already associated with the dragon. He'd taken it as his symbol. So he was really associated with Satan, the light bearer, illumination, the sun, and the dragon, the serpent. And their seed was Tammuz, who was said to be the incarnation of Nimrod on the earth. And you had to worship him at point of death. That was the first world empire, and it was the prototype of all the world empires that followed. It's the head, Babel. And uh, when Babel was, dis uh, when God, you know, confused the languages and they were scattered, they carried this unholy trinity into all the different cultures with different names. And one of the names was Baal, okay? And one of the names was Tammuz. Baal just means the Lord. Uh, it's a false Christ, an imposter Christ. And Jezebel brought Baal worship into the camp, into Israel, and replaced the uh, prophets of God and the priesthood with eunuchs to Baal. Her, her priests were, were Baal worshipers. And Baal pretends to be Jehovah, but he's a hard taskmaster. And there's no blood uh, for remission of sin. And it's law, law, law. And he demands that you sacrifice your children and everything, you know. Um, now, Tammuz, that name shows up in, that's another name for uh, Baal. He has all these different names, right? That name shows up in Jeremiah when God says, I'll show you another abomination. And he shows, or was it Ezekiel? Either Ezekiel or Jeremiah, maybe it was Ezekiel. He said, I saw women making cakes to the queen of heaven and weeping for Tammuz because Tammuz was said to have died and he was going to be resurrected. Uh, and that is where we get Easter from. And his birth, by the way, was December 25th. Christmas comes from this. All the pagan religions are centered in this Babylonian trinity of Nimrod, Semiramis, the queen of heaven, and Tammuz, who is a false Christ, uh, who represents himself as the son of God, but he's not. He's an imposter. And when Paul says in Corinthians, what fellowship does Belial, that's another name, have with the Lord and the table of demons with the cup of the Lord, come out and touch not the unclean thing, he's talking about the false teachers he, they, they're literally bringing another Jesus who is Baal. Baal is the Antichrist. Eventually, Baal will be the Antichrist. All the occultic religions long for the day when Tammuz will be resurrected. Um, and the Catholics celebrate all this with Easter and Christmas and their unholy mass and their blasphemous re-sacrifice of, of the Christ and all that stuff. Uh, eventually, the last... Um, the beast that arises from the abyss, Apollyon, which is the Greek name for Tammuz, Apollos, he will arise of the abyss, and he will be uh, uh, the eighth, although he's of the seven former kingdoms, because he's of the first. He's, he's Nimrod reincarnated. That's what they believe, or resurrected. He was, and he was 
he, 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 he was and he was not and then he will be because he ascends uh, from the abyss he, he comes from perdition he had some kind of pact with the devil and he's going to be raised up uh, it's crazy stuff but this is the origin of the pagan religions and this is the, the uh, demonic entity behind the false teachers and their works substitute for Christ where they end up presenting another Jesus and another gospel and a cursed gospel now whether they know they're doing it or not doesn't matter when they come to you and they're vainly puffed up in the mindset of the flesh taking their stand on visions they've seen and not holding to the head and they're judging you unworthy of your prize and they're coming to you with ordinances do not handle, do not touch, do not taste and they are carrying you off as spoil according to their philosophy empty deceit, the traditions of men the elements of the world all of that is related to Baal okay uh, now you say well, how did he get into all this because of the word unclean see we think unclean means nudie magazines here but based on everything he's been saying I truly believe it also means that all these religious seductions are unclean and this is the same thing that he's telling them in Corinth. Come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. You're the temple of God. God said, I will dwell among you and you will be my children and I'll be your father. Uh, we're to have nothing to do with false teachers. Every letter that Paul writes, you don't get a license to love false teachers. You're to separate from them. Um, but here, he's really telling them that, look, yes, these people can spoil you, but the problem is in you. It's in your members. They can entice you because your members have a thirst for the things they offer. And you need to call it what it is. See, when they offer you the traditions of men and the elements of the world and um, the ordinances do not handle, do not taste, do not touch and all these things that appear to have a show of wisdom and will worship and self-abasement and the severe treatment of the body, it all looks good. It looks holy. They look holier than you. And your desire for it, you need to name it what it is. That desire is not a holy desire. It's covetousness. It's idolatry. It's evil consubience. And this, this preference you have for these people where you think, see, it's interesting. I've met quite a few people who have a charisma, a spiritual charisma, where there's like a mysticism to them. And in my eyes, they can do no wrong. Even to this day, there's a few people that are dear in my heart from way back when, where it's a mystery to me how they could be false teachers because I know they're anointed. I mean, I still struggle with it because of the feelings of the presence of God I thought I had in their presence and the supposed godliness that they exercised and the supposed fruitfulness I saw and the power that I saw demonstrated in these people. Okay, but they were false teachers and they had a false gospel. They had an accursed gospel. What am I to do with that? Well, I'm to see that this favor that they have in my eyes is inordinate affection. Mortify your members which are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil consubience, and covetousness, which are kind of the same thing, which is idolatry. The reason I, I believe that it's the same thing is because in Romans 7, when he said, when the law, which said, thou shalt not covet, uh, the law of sin in my members took advantage of the commandment and worked all matter of consubiousness in me. He used that word. So it must relate and I don't have it in front of me where I can look up the Greek but I think they're related and it amounts to idolatry 
you know, when I think, oh man, that guy was spiritual. Man, he really, when he spoke, there was something to it. I could feel it. That is idolatry and inordinate affection. Especially considering, and, and they could do no wrong. No matter what they did, I would give them a pass. And it took years for me, even though they had a false gospel and I knew it, for me to really condemn it and say, I have to mark and avoid and turn away and stop giving the benefit of the doubt and stop obeying them and stop, and stop giving my money and stop giving my time and stop caring what they think. Why did I keep giving to them and submitting myself to them even once I knew they had the gospel wrong? I wouldn't give anybody else that kind of attention. Well, it's because there was a covetousness in me and an inordinate affection. And I thought it was my desire for holiness and my approval of excellent things, my approval of spiritual things. That, well, there's something spiritual about that guy, and I can recognize it. I can discern it. I know that it's anointing. I can, I've felt that before. Okay? That feels like God. You go, that feels like God. What is that? That's an unclean spirit. You want to know the truth? Unclean spirits affect you so that you're willing to go against your own conscience and what the Bible says clearly uh, and bring yourself into damage and be carried off as spoil and give up your crown and surrender yourself and your ability to think and to even go against your own conscience in order to pursue being affiliated with someone because you get a feeling around them or this environment. And that's really what it came down to for me. In the charismatic world, you know, there was a false apostles and false prophets and, and all kinds of crazy false gospel and false manifestations of stuff. But the feelings that I got were so strong and I associated those things with holiness and they weren't. They were unclean spirits. I was touching unclean things. Now related to fornication, he could be talking about literal fornication here. But he could also be talking about dealing with the law, which is a kind of spiritual fornication which Jezebel causes uh, in Thyatira. Sorry, I'm jumping out again, but in Thyatira, he says, you know, you tolerate that woman who calls herself a prophetess who seduces my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. What does Jezebel do? She introduces Baal worship. What is Baal? Baal is another Jesus. He's the hard taskmaster. He, he, he's a Jesus with no grace. He pretends to fill, fulfill the prophecies, but there's no shedding of blood for the remission of sins. The work is not finished. He's Antichrist. Antichrist, which means he opposes and replaces Christ. You know, Antichrist in the Greek, anti means to replace, replacement for Christ. Uh, vicar in Latin, Vicar of Christ. It's funny that the Pope calls himself the Vicar of Christ. He's literally got the title Antichrist, and he's parading around calling himself the Antichrist. <laughs> but anti means to replace Christ. He's in the place of Christ while denying the sufficiency and the efficacy of the work of Christ. No, his blood is not sufficient. You still owe God. You're in debt. You're under the wage system. There are still rewards and punishments for you. There's still a wage to be earned and punishments to avoid. Okay, that is an accursed gospel. No justification didn't give you Christ and the blessing and the spirit and peace with God and a stand in the grace of God so that today you have access to the holiest no matter what you did. You can come forward boldly to the throne of grace and uh, receive help and he gives you wisdom without upbraiding the father of lights is totally available to you because of justification nope you've got to repent and cleanse yourself or else God will have nothing to do he turned his back on you when you sinned the blood of Jesus Christ deals with getting you to heaven but it doesn't actually give you peace with God now there's a different kind of justification for you for today uh, that's an accursed gospel 
that comes in the name of Jesus, but it's another Jesus. And this Jesus calls himself Jesus, but he's Baal. Okay? And there's a lot of people that worship Baal and think it's Jesus. The most obvious are the Catholics. The Roman Catholic system is literally a revival of the Babylonian uh, system of worship down to the, the dress code and everything. Uh, and it's so in your face, it's ridiculous with the queen of heaven and the cakes and the, you know, just like, um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel said, they're making, they're mourning over Tammuz and making cakes to the queen of heaven, the mother of God. She called herself the mother of God. And they, their emblem for the Pope is the sun. Uh, they associate themselves with the sun. Anyway, uh, that's Baal worship. That's not Christ. That's a false Christ. It's a precursor to the Antichrist. But it comes in the name of Jesus. Well, that's what the false teaching does. And, you know, Rome is just one example. There's so many examples. The Arminians, the Calvins, Calvinists, the uh, Hebrew roots, uh, the people that say that justification by faith is only for this dispensation, which means other people were justified they say other people were justified by works which means that the work of Christ was in vain if anybody could be justified by works according to Paul uh, Christ died in vain if there was a law that could give righteousness uh, our life Christ died in vain um, that is anti-Christ they're giving you another Jesus whose work is not according to the testimony of God in scriptures. And it's unclean. So what is it in me that causes me to fall for it? Well, it's the things that I think are good. It's my pursuit of holiness. What I think is my pursuit of holiness. You know, when I was in the charismatic church, then in the inner life movement, and then in the Chinese church, all of that was unclean. And all of it was a pursuit that was uh, idolatry. And in every single case, there were brothers and false brothers and leaders who were wolves that had my uttermost affection. And it was inordinate. In fact, my affection for those people was more than my affection for my wife by far. In fact, it ruined my marriage. Uh, that's inordinate affection. And I had evil desires to be something in those, in that religion. And I spent all my time praying and seeking experiences of what I thought was holiness. I was trying in my prayer closet to match the feelings I often had while I was with these people under a spell of their mysticism that I thought was their godliness but was actually an unclean spirit as they delivered their false gospel. I mean, think about this. You know, there's this, there's what we think is the glory while people speak a false gospel. And so many people come out of church and they go, I don't understand. Everything they said was wrong, and yet I know I felt the presence of God so strong. Well, the law has glory, but it's a glory that kills. It's a ministry of condemnation and death, and it's a fading glory, so that when you leave, you're weaker than when, it, when you came. So there's that glory, if they're ministering the law. But there's also unclean spirits. That doesn't mean you have a demon but you are involving yourselves with things that defile. Um, and Paul was very strong, and in fact, all the apostles were very strong about coming out from unclean things and maintaining the priesthood of believers uh, and keeping our garments and, and being pure. And that is much more related to... Uh, teachings and doctrine than you think than nudie magazines I'm not saying it's not related to nudie magazines but uh, somebody asked me 
today about what about that scripture because a lot of Lord Shippers use it to emphasize sinless perfectionism. Uh, let those who are Christ keep themselves from iniquity. Um, let me look at that real quick. Uh, sometimes. Okay, won't let me. It's in Timothy. Keep iniquity. Sorry, you guys. I promise I'll get it. It's in first or second Timothy. I hate typing on a phone. I don't know why. I've never been able to type on a phone. No matter how hard I try, I can't thumb type. Uh, it's, uh, here it is. Nevertheless, the foundation of the Lord stands firm, uh, or sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows who those who are his and let those who name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Doesn't that sound like he's talking about sinless perfection and sin? But if you look back, he says, uh, study yourself to show yourselves approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase more unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as does a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Phileas, who concerning the truth of erred, saying that the resurrection is past, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God is sure. No, having this seal, the Lord knows that them that are his, and every, let everyone who names uh, the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of uh, gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth. And then he says, uh, some of honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purges of these, he'll be a vessel of honor. Purge himself of what? The vessels of dishonor. What are the vessels of dishonor? Hymenaeus and Philetus and people who uh, go on to profane babblings, resisting the truth and overthrowing people's face. They're in the house, but they are building with wood, hay, and stubble. Now, it's interesting. Even in 1 Corinthians 3, when he talks about reward... He says, you are God's field and you are God's building. And you are, he says, if any man destroys God's temple, which temple you are, him God will destroy. And people say, see, if you sin, God's going to kill you. Okay, no. He's talking about false teachers bringing another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit to damage the building of God, which is the church. Again, Almost every time Paul is talking about, and Jesus, uh, when they put covetousness and idolatry and uncleanness and these things together, they're usually, in. if you look in context, they're talking about false teachings. And isn't that the case here with uh, Colossians? What was he talking about the whole last chapter? He's not talking about something else. He's talking about the same thing. What he's saying is, I want you to identify in you the thing that makes you um, drawn to these things. You think it's the good parts of you. Call it what it is. Instead of saying it's a desire for holiness, it's not. It's inordinate affection. It's uncleanness. It's evil desires. It's consumiousness and covetousness. It's idolatry. You know, John ends 1 John with little children, keep yourselves from idols. I did a whole message on that. Why does he say that? Because it seems to be out of nowhere. Because the whole book, he's talking about, he says, I write these things concerning those who seduce you. They're of the world. Uh, and they don't have the love of the Father in them. 
and they've taken the way of Cain and they're antichrist. They deny the work of Christ and, and yet they're using love language and saying that they love God and it must be impressive to the believers because they're in their midst and they're seducing them. And yet he's telling them, look, they don't have eternal life. They hate the brethren. They've gone the way of Cain. They're walking in darkness. They lie and the truth is not in them. They say they have fellowship with God, but they say they have no sin. Uh, they deny Jesus Christ. They say they love the uh, God, but they hate the brethren. And they are trying to put you under law. And they reject Jesus Christ. They're murderers. Don't even pray for them. They've committed the sin unto death. Uh, when he says, when he finishes the book, he says, little children, keep yourself from idols. It's because the way they can seduce you is your own desire for what you think is godliness. And that's what he was talking about. You know, your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, should be manifested, we should be manifested with glory. If you're dead with Christ, why are you, uh, why are you seeking to be ruled by ordinances, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, as if you're living in the world. None of these things have any value against the real indulgence of the flesh. You know what the real indulgence of the flesh? Your desire to be manifested as a godly person, apart from Christ. That's why these people can seduce you. So, instead, you need to see that you're dead, and your life is hidden with Christ to God, and then you need to seek the things which are above, which is what? Christ himself. How? Through the doctrine of Christ. And then you need to re reckon, to mortify is to reckon that your body is, is dead. And he says, mortify your members which are on the earth. Everything on the earth is dead. I'm not seeking to uh, glorify what's on the earth. I want to label it correctly and agree with God's judgment. You know, to agree with God's judgment is to label things correctly. You know, Adam, the first, the only job he was given in the garden that we really know of, he was to tend it, but God walked all the, Adam, walked all the animals past Adam and had him name them. His, his job seemed to be to approve what God had made and designate it and recognize it and label it. And that's what we need to do. It's called agreeing with God's judgment. And in that we represent him. Do we agree with God's judgment? Or do we say, no, this is actually my desire for holiness. You know, when I'm pursuing that feeling and I really, I want that feeling more than anything. And I'm going to go to that worship service because they're having a group uh, from Gateway House of Prayer. And they're all plugged into the Hillsong. I know that Hillsong is heretical and they're dominionist NAR and, and they're they've got angel feathers and they're worshiping demons and practicing necromancy. Uh, but I love their music and I love the feeling it gets me. I'm going to go to gateway house of prayer tonight. You know, I, I really, I really need this. Okay. What is that? Is that a desire for godliness? No, it's uncleanness and it's covetousness. Okay. And it's fornication for you to go. You are not willing to have Christ, the manna, in the wilderness. You are hungry for leeks and onions. You want a feeling. You want this glory, this earthly glory that's associated with uh, these feelings you get. And you're willing to call it God to give your conscience, a, uh, so that your conscience will approve of it. And yet it's fornication because you're going after the law. When you go after, you know, you're going after mystical legalism, you're going to these environments and subjecting yourself to teachings that are cursed gospels and riddled with law, and they're marrying you to Baal, a false Jesus. How is that not fornication? It's spiritual fornication. So I know this is a heavy message, and I didn't know that's what I was going to say, but that's what he's talking about. Um, <laughs> among other things, I think that that is actually the main point. Uh, 
go back and read chapter two, or, or if you've been listening along, you'll probably agree. If you've just heard this message, it may seem really jarring, and you may go, no, what is he? he doesn't know what he's talking about. We'll go back and read chapter two. Prove me wrong. All right, take care.